Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. In the legislative building in Regina, we have Deputy Premier and Minister of Education, Gordon Wyant. Joining us over the phone line is Dr. Saqib Shahab. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome Sue Schmid here as our ASL interpreter. Karen Nurkowski is taking a well-deserved week off. Uh, Deputy Premier Wyant will have an opening statement followed by time for questions. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, everyone. For almost three months now, our schools and classrooms have been closed in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Just as Saskatchewan people have done a tremendous job in fighting the virus, Saskatchewan students, parents, and teachers have shown tremendous resolve in persevering through this unprecedented situation. As we approach what would be the summer break in our regular school calendar, I know that students, parents, and teachers are now wondering what comes next. So today I'm here to say that students and staff will be returning to school this fall. As early as September 1st, our classrooms will again be a place of teaching, learning, and community for students across Saskatchewan. As we prepare our plan for instruction to take place within our schools, our priority continues to be the health and safety of our students, our staff, and caregivers. We'll continue to take the advice and recommendations of our Chief Medical Health Officer. As Dr. Shahab has previously stated, maintaining physical distancing is less practical with young children. Our focus is on reducing risk through minimizing physical contact and putting in place protections not only for students, but caregivers and staff. To provide provincial level direction on these operational matters, the Education Response Planning Team, which includes representation from the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation, the Saskatchewan School Boards Association and the Ministry of Education, will work with school divisions to navigate through those logistics. And I want to thank them for their very hard work. We've been closely observing as other jurisdictions have cautiously started to resume in-class learning and we'll continue to closely monitor to understand the experiences that they have had with school reopening. For the past several weeks, the Ministry of Education, with the input of the response planning team, has been developing public health guidelines with the Ministry of Health. While these guidelines are still being finalized, as early as next week, we'll be looking to release those guidelines for school divisions to ensure that our schools are safe for our students, staff, and caregivers. We know that there will be many questions from school boards, from teachers and parents, and students as we prepare for a fall return to classroom, which is why we're communicating this today and why we will be releasing these guidelines as early as next week to ensure that there is ample time to address those questions and prepare students for the return to school. I'd also like to note that while a return to the classroom in the fall is at the scenario we are planning for, we will have contingency plans in place in the event that there becomes an elevated transmission risk and in-class learning cannot resume as planned, either regionally or provincially. As our provinces reaches new milestones toward getting back to a new normal, I would ask for your continued cooperation as we implement policies and procedures for our school communities. And lastly, I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank the teachers and staff for the tremendous job they have done connecting with their students while in-class learning has been suspended. Thank you, Minister. We now have time for questions. We'll take our first question on the phone line. We have Mark Smith with CTV. Yes, uh, this question is uh, along the lines of the school, but a little bit different. Uh, how is the province planning to adjust its curriculum to better reflect the contributions of black people in Canada? Is that something that the, the province is looking at? Well, you know, we've uh, had lots of conversations about this over the last short period of time, and certainly, and the Premier has been very clear, that racism has, has no place in this province. Our curriculum does address the issue of racism. Uh, certainly, uh, the province was the first province in the country to introduce treaty education in the classroom, which has re recently been been updated as recently as yesterday I had a conversation with the Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission to talk about what help he can provide us in ensuring that our curriculum is responsive to the current situation that's happening and so we'll continue those conversations with him uh, he has certainly been a leader when it comes to uh, uh, teaching and ensuring that students understand what their rights and responsibilities through citizenship education is all about and so We'll continue to do some work with him and in the meantime, having some conversations with my ministry staff to ensure that, uh, that what we do is increase uh, our, uh, our curriculum development around this very important matter. 
You have a follow-up, Mark? Yes, this one's for uh, Dr. Shahab. A uh, local jewelry artist made a pin uh, of a sweater vest for him. Uh, what's his thoughts on that? <laughs> Do we have Dr. Shahab on the phone line? Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Actually, it gives me a chance to thank uh, uh, Megan Hazel for that kind gift I received in the um, in the legislature yesterday. And I think it's just uh, I think many people have reached out to me personally, but also uh, many of us working in the health sector and other uh, sectors during COVID. And I think. Um, I, I, I gratefully accept that with the understanding that this actually recognizes all of us who are working, uh, both uh, people in the health system, government, schools, other sectors, as well as the broader community in terms of pulling together while staying apart to address COVID. And my final comment would be that the fact that it's a West um, uh, shows that, you know, Wests are very practical. We can use uh, them in all four seasons in Saskatchewan, even on chilly summer nights. So, you know, we are a province which is pragmatic and practical. That's how we would address COVID and other issues in the past. So I think uh, I appreciate the symbolism there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We'll take our for, uh, next question from the phone line. We have Ashley Martin with the Leader Post. Hi. Um, I, I realize that the guidelines are still being finalized, but Minister Wyant, can you give us any hints as to what some of the guidelines for students and staff returning to schools might be. Um, you did say in your introduction that um, physical distancing can be less practical for young children, so I'm wondering what some of the guidelines might look like. Well, physical distancing is still going to be important, but as I did mention, it is going to be less practical. Uh, as the Chief Medical Health Officer kind of reviews what the guidelines uh, are, we can talk about things like separate entrances to the school, for instance, whether there's going to be staggered classrooms, whether there's going to be some rescheduling. And so these are all things that uh, we'll give due consideration to. And this really all depends on what the state of affairs is uh, when school returns in September. If the ongoing uh, risk is significantly minimized, uh, then things will be a little bit different than if the risk factors are higher. And so some of the uh, some of the considerations that are going to have to go into this uh, is really going to be quite flexible in terms of ensuring that what we provide uh, is a safe learning environment for our children and a safe working environment for teachers and staff. And so uh, th there will be a lot of things to give some consideration to as the school divisions start to plan. But as I say, the key element is ensuring that we we provide a safe learning environment for our children and 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 a working environment for our staff. And so. Uh, we'll be very careful to make sure that that's the guiding principle as those rules are uh, as those rules are developed and implemented. Do you have a follow-up, Ashley? Yeah, um, I guess just in terms of the contingency plans that you mentioned, uh, what might those look like? Is that more online learning, or like what? What is a contingency plan? Well, again, depending the contingency really depend on what the state of affairs are in September. But I've mentioned alternative entrances, uh, staggered class times, flexible flexible schedules. Online learning can continue to be a part of that, I think. And we've had some great experience over the last number of months with, with online learning. We've learned a lot about alternate delivery of educational opportunities to kids. And so that can all form part of, of, what, uh, of what those alternative protocols might be. The key here is to ensure, as I say, the safety of kids in the classroom, but to make sure that we provide an equitable learning opportunity uh, for all the kids across the entire province. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi, I'm wondering uh, if the government is considering having fewer children in the classroom, let's say splitting uh, one grade one class in, in half or having kids come in the morning or the afternoon. Uh, are these some of the uh, things that are being weighed right now? Is that an option? Those are all matters that will be taken into consideration as the guidelines are developed. Again, uh, Adam, this is really dependent on what the state of affairs are in September. 
we want to make sure we provide uh, equitable learning opportunities. And so making sure that we provide safe environments is the key. And so we'll be very much relying on the advice of the Chief Medical Health Officer as we move forward to September. But school divisions will have an opportunity uh, in concert with the response planning team to make sure that those contingencies, those plans are in place to, uh, to deal with uh, pretty much every, any eventuality that happens as a result of, of, uh, of the virus. And we're hoping, of course, our, is to have schools uh, fully opened, but there will be some challenges within different schools in terms of social distancing, making sure that uh, kids are, are as uh, uh, distant as possible, having regard to the fact that we want to continue to provide that learning. And so, uh, we'll see what happens as we move forward to September, but uh, I'm confident that the rules that, and the protocols that will be in place uh, you know, will, be, will be amenable to ensuring that we pro provide a proper education to those kids. Follow up, Adam? I, I was just going to ask, this is for uh, Dr. Shahab and also uh, the Minister, what's the biggest factor in making uh, in classroom the plan uh, for the fall? Is it making sure that uh, kids can get back to to to, uh, to the classroom? Is it uh, that the cases are low and, and we're on a good trajectory? What what made, what made went into making this decision? Well, perhaps I'll start uh, and Dr. Shahab can add to, uh, to my comments. We've certainly heard uh, from many teachers and many parents uh, across this province that they want to see their kids return to school. We think that cl in-class learning is the best way for children to uh, gain their education. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've had some success with online learning and other delivery models over the last number of months, we do believe that in-class learning is the best option for children, uh, augmented by those other things. And so uh, safety of our class, safety of our, our, our students and our, and, our, and our teachers is the top priority. So whatever the protocols are that are in place at the beginning of September, we'll certainly recognize the need to ensure a safe learning environment for kids. But I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, parents and teachers want to see, parents want their kids back in classrooms and teachers want to be teaching in those classrooms and so I think that's important from a, from a learning perspective. You have a follow-up, Adam? Or is Dr. Shahab on the line to speak to that question as well? Yeah, so I can, uh, so uh, um, Saqib Shahab, I can make a few comments as well. So we have been following very closely uh, school reopening in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, obviously Australia has a low COVID transmission rate similar to Saskatchewan. They have their school year, you know, in, in what's our summer, which is their, uh, you know, uh, uh, spring and winter months. And uh, we have been reassured by the fact that they have not seen large scale transmission in the school setting and have uh, and so Australia and Southeast Asia, they have been able to open more in the in in the presence of low transmission, more or less in a regular fashion with you know usual classes sizes, but some attention to physical distancing and those kind of uh, uh, measures. We've also watched closely um, school reopening in Europe and in two provinces in Canada recently. Um, Europe a bit earlier than two provinces in Canada, and we've seen that they have opened in a slightly different way with slightly lower class sizes where it's voluntary for children to come. And they have seen some limited transmission, but no further transmission from schools to uh, households. Uh, so, you know, that just supports the, uh, the observation that children don't really get that sick with COVID for the most part and don't transmit that well either. So COVID-19 behaves very differently in children than coughs and colds or influenza. Uh, so based on that, as Mr. Wyan said, you know, we would really um, hope to go to back to school as much as possible as normal with some additional precautions around, uh, you know, hand washing and staying home if you're sick and other measures. But if local epidemiology uh, is not as low a, a, as it is now, there may be some additional considerations that may apply at a local or regional level. Uh, and we will obviously continue to see how the school year uh, continues in the Southern Hemisphere and Europe and other places to learn from that as well. Thank you. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Lisa Schick with CJME. Hi. Um, 
So Dr. Shahab says kids don't get sick as much or transmit COVID as well as adults. So what would have to happen for you to cancel this plan and go to the contingency? Well, we'd have to see a, a significant uh, increase, I think, with respect to uh, the spread of, of COVID within the community. And as, as Dr. Shahab has said, we will be looking at that from a regional perspective, uh, a community perspective, and a provincial perspective. So depending on what the uh, infection rates are, we will have to readjust and we'll have to reconsider some of the uh, contingency plans that we, we have in place. And so I think that that's going to be the critical factor in determining uh, whether we go to a uh, contingency plan, whether or not we uh, um, advance some uh, different protocols as a result of that. We're certainly hoping that that's not the case. Our plan is to ensure that schools are fully open and that children are fully attending. Uh, but again, it really will really depend, I think, on, uh, on what the infection rate is and whether or not there's some significant community transmission as a result of going back to school. You have a follow-up, Lisa? Maybe. Uh, Go ahead, doctor. Yeah, so uh, I think this is something that we all need to think about in the fall that we've learned a lot about COVID in the last two months. We know that physical distancing at home, at work, at play uh, keeps us all safe. Uh, we also know that there's co-dependencies between daycare, schools, and parents going to work. So if we see a second wave in the fall, we really don't want to necessarily go into full lockdown as we did in March, April. We need to look at transmission trends and which is the sector causing the transmission. And we also need to think about maybe in the fall, once we see an increase in transmission, making more use of personal protection like masks in the home setting. For example, if you have a child going to school and a person who's vulnerable, older or with underlying risk factors, Individuals who are at higher risk can use a mask at home or uh, observe physical distancing from a child who's going to school if there's increase in local transmission, not so much when there's no increase in local transmission. So again, these are some of the um, kind of recommendations that we will look at where we, you try to reduce uh, disruption in terms of school attendance and other things as much as possible while keeping household and community transmission low but of course, in, if the, in the rare instance where we see a significant increase in transmission, that may impact schools, but also other sectors. But we really don't think we would go there unless there was a significant increase in transmission, which we hope we can uh, control by other public health measures like physical distancing, incre increased use of masks and other measures where required in the home setting, but not in the school setting. Uh, if, uh, and primarily for pe by people who are more vulnerable. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Lisa? Yes. Um, kind of in that answer, I believe there was mention of a second wave. Dr. Shahab, you talked about a, a significant increase uh, in transmission. What does that look like kind of numbers-wise? Are we talking about 10 cases? Are we talking about 1,000 cases to qualify as a, a second wave? Yeah, thank you. So uh, what what the scenarios in the future suggest is they can be ongoing small clusters and outbreaks like we have seen in Saskatchewan. We can have waves that would be even a small, even what's classified as a small wave would be much larger than we saw. I think we were so successful in our public health measures and everything we did individually that we never really saw a significant wave in Saskatchewan except in the Northwest and the Laloshan area. But that's a good example of what a significant small wave can look like. And even that was managed by specific public health measures and interventions. But you know, at a local level, if we are seeing dozens of cases a day if within a town or a community, or at a provincial level, if we're seeing maybe more than 100 cases a day, that's the kind of numbers which we never saw in the spring. But if we started seeing either locally or provincially, many more cases than we saw actually in the spring, then we would have to think either locally or provincially specific measures to further reduce transmission, and that may include specific measures regarding where the transmission is happening, or specific measures around uh, what are the settings where transmission is happening, but we would still try to minimize any disruption, disruption to schools or learning opportunities. But at that point, they, that may require some changes in, in class size or other things, but, uh, but it would have to be a significantly more transmission than what we saw 
anywhere in Saskatchewan, except maybe the Northwest, the, the Lalaushan area. Thank you. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Dan Jones with MBC. Yeah, Minister, when I think about your, uh, your plan to go back to school in the fall, I'm thinking about Northern First Nations, particularly the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation, who has some level of control over their schools and their concerns about the possible reopening and a second wave in the fall. What discussions have you had with leadership there about uh, easing those concerns and opening up schools there? Well, part of the work that we're doing with the response planning team is engaging with all the school divisions around the province. So there have been some conversations. We know that there are some unique challenges uh, with that particular school division. We're concerned about a number of things, but I know that the work that's been being done uh, by the response planning team in conjunction with the Ministry of Education, I think is working to address address a number of those concerns. And so we'll continue to have those conversations with the school division. As I mentioned at the beginning, our goal is to ensure that an equitable level of education is being provided to all children in the province, and that, uh, that, includes, uh, that includes kids in that particular school division. So we'll continue to work with that school division. I have all the confidence uh, in the response planning team to make sure that what we're doing from an instructional perspective um, is meeting the needs of that school division as we always have. Do you have a follow-up, Dan? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. And we have one last question on the phone line. We have Peter Lozinski with the PA Herald. Uh, hi, Minister. Uh, with this re return to classrooms, uh, for uh, well, many teachers, uh, students, parents are asking for that. Uh, some may feel more comfortable continuing online. Will there be the option for divisions to continue sort of a mixed return of online and in-person classes? You bet. You know, we've heard from some uh, parents who are, uh, you know, perhaps uh, concerned about their children going back to class, particularly children who may be immune compromised. So one of the things that the response planning team is doing is working to ensure that, uh, that we provide a level of education, a good level of education to those kids as well, so that to the extent that parents are, are reluctant to send their kids to class, we need to make sure that we have an alternate delivery model for those children. And, and that could be online learning. It could be... Uh, you know, delivery of lessons from teachers as a lot of that's been done over the last number of months. And so we're quite confident we're going to be able to meet that need for those children that, uh, that don't want to return to class or for those parents that uh, have some concerns. The reason that we're making the announcement today, as I mentioned at the beginning, was to ensure that we gave uh, everybody as much notice as possible about the plan to return in September so that people can make the appropriate arrangements. But again, if there are parents that are concerned, especially parents of children who are immune compromised that have some concerns about returning to the classroom, there's certainly going to be some arrangements made and we're very confident with the response planning team and the work that the school divisions will have to do to accommodate those kids. You have a follow-up, Peter? Yeah, uh, and then when it comes to uh, the, the, this return, uh, teachers, of course, will be expected to uh, follow whatever guidelines you guys do put out. Will there be an increase in uh, funding or a cap on class size or uh, more supports for classrooms that teachers uh, have enough resources to both enforce uh, what they need to enforce public health-wise while teaching and dealing with any complex needs? Well, we're certainly going to be uh, uh, giving some uh, thought to what additional resources may be available. We know that there are going to be some additional costs that school divisions are going to have to shoulder in terms of delivering uh, with these new protocols. And so we're going to assess uh, what those are in consultation with the various school divisions and with the ministry uh, to uh, talk about how we're going to address those additional needs. Uh, but that's a conversation that we're going to have to have with the school divisions. Uh, Last year's budget was, again, the largest budget for education delivery in the history of the province. We're very proud of that. But to the extent that there are going to be additional resources that are going to be needed, we're going to have to have conversations with the school divisions to determine exactly what that will, what that will be. Thank you very much for joining us today, everyone. For those on the line, tomorrow, Health Minister Jim Ryder will be joined by SHA CEO Scott Livingstone at the usual time to provide an update on health system services. Uh, thanks for joining us today.